Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on the new UK accessibility law and what to do about it. My name is Oliver Emberton. I'm the CEO of Silktide and I'm also the author of the forthcoming book on web accessibility made easy, a guide for the rest of us. Today, I'm going to be talking about the new law for UK public sector websites. And we're also going to be looking at the state of your website specifically, because before this, we did some research and we looked at the UK public sector websites and we've identified the most common problems and challenges that you face. We're going to look at those. We're also going to look mostly at what you actually have to do about it. Um, that's quite a, a large section. It's going to take up most of today. We're going to have a brief interval to totally panic about the results and then hopefully we'll gather our senses and form some practical solutions and take some deep breaths at the end. So just to let you know the format of today, this will be a 50 minute talk um, with uh, 10 minutes Q&A at the end. So you should have some kind of Q&A button, depending on the webinar software you are using, which you can press at any time and you can leave a question. You can also review other people's questions and you can upvote questions. So I encourage you to do that. The last 10 minutes, we'll be going through the most upvoted questions. Okay, so where do we start? Well, we start with this. This is the new EU directive. Um, and I encourage you to read it in your own time. It's not a lot of fun, but the highly condensed short version is you have two things you now need to worry about doing. The first is you need to meet this new accessibility standard that is affectionately known as WCAG 2.1 AA. Um, the second thing is you need to publish an accessibility statement about it. Now, the accessibility statement is not too difficult. It's literally just saying, um, this is the current state of our accessibility as we understand it. These are the people you should contact in the event you have a problem with your accessibility or any questions. Um, it's fairly standard. We're not really going to talk about that today. It shouldn't cause you too much difficulty. The first part, on the other hand, well, that's going to be a little bit more tricky. So for, let's look at when you actually have to get this done. If you have a new website, which is defined as a website that was published after the 2nd of September last year, sorry, the 22nd of September, that website has to comply by this September. If, on the other hand, you have anything else, which most of you will, you have until next September. So for the most part, that means about 14 months. How hard can that be? Well, you may not think it's that challenging. Um, we did a little bit of research. So I would ask you to guess how big you think your website is. Um, in my experience, most people, most organizations actually don't know. And if you're at a university, you probably don't even know how many websites you have. But um, let's just imagine the primary domain for your website. So say example.com and imagine how many pages you have. So we looked at the three groups that are most represented on today's webinar, which are NHS trusts, councils and universities. And uh, we took a sample of those and did some measuring. So NHS trusts on average have about 2,100 pages and about 500 PDFs. Quite sizable, not too bad. Councils have a quite substantial 18,500 page average and about 3,300 PDFs. And universities go all the way up to 30,927 pages of about 2,500 PDFs. Um, which means that many UK universities have more pages than students, which is perhaps a little concerning. Um, I should clarify, these figures are only for your main domain. We didn't look for anything else. And also, in some cases, we hit 100,000 pages for one site. We ignored those. So the real numbers will actually be a little bit higher, but it gives you some idea. So just as a full exercise, let's imagine you've got, we'll take the average of those, 20,000 pages. We also measured the first 100 pages of your site and we looked at the number of issues you've had on those pages and we discovered on average across the whole uk public sector you had 44.1 issues per page which sounds like a lot but it's actually pretty good it's uh, better than the majority of websites nevertheless it's still quite significant as a hurdle to clear um, so you've got 20,000 pages, 44 issues per page, and you've got 14 months. So times that by that and divide by that, and you get 63,300 
and 34 issues to fix per month, which is just about seven and a half per minute, assuming you allow yourself weekends. So yeah, that's gonna be um, an interesting challenge for the times ahead. Now, we actually forgot a few things. We, we didn't count there your PDFs. We didn't count your subdomains. We didn't count any private login areas you might have. And in particular, some of these sites will do. And of course, this is a side project. This is usually not someone's dedicated day job. This is something you have to meet and maybe you don't have much resource for. So yes, it's not that straightforward, but it's what we'll be looking at today. Um, you might well summarize it as the five stages of becoming accessible. Um, hopefully, I will be walking you through these throughout today. Uh, you may well be beginning with denial and the feeling that, oh no, I don't have to do this, and working through anger, bargaining, depression, and hopefully, ultimately, acceptance. But to get there, we're going to start off with some fundamentals. So let's take a brief moment to cover some jargon and find out how to keep up with your cool friends at parties when you're discussing WPAG 2.1 AA, which I know you always do. So this is a standard. This, uh, something like WCAG 2.0 or WCAG 2.1, that's a standard. And you're probably at least partly familiar with the first one. WCAG 2.0 is the accessibility standard that pretty much everyone had to follow for about 10 years. Um, and it was written for context at the time when the iPhone had not been invented and it was released at the time that the first iPhone um, was coming out. So the phones you see at the bottom of this screen are, uh, are basically what people had at that time. Um, the world has obviously moved on quite a lot since then. Um, the main aim of WCAG 2.1 is to expand that standard to incorporate the many, many new challenges that have occurred as a result of mobile and tablet devices in particular. Um, so if you know WCAG 2.0, WCAG 2.1 is the same, but it has extra stuff added. And you might think, well, why, why are you adding this stuff? I mean, um, it's commonly assumed that people who um, are using accessible technology are using a desktop computer and a screen reader. That's the kind of the, the model that most people have in their heads, it seems. Um, and it's incredibly out of date. The truth is, we all know we've moved on in the last decade or so to using mobile phones first, but it's, it's actually also true of people using accessible technologies. To give one example here, this is uh, the percentage of mobile screen reader use over desktop. And you can see how dramatically that has changed. So basically, think of your accessible users, surprisingly, as just regular users. They have many of the same technologies and challenges as you. Um, and many of the approaches people are using are very much out of sync with that. So quickly, uh, WCAG has three levels. This is basically how severe or important something is. Single A, double A, triple A. Must do, should do, and ideally do. Except not really, because treble A is basically impossible. You have about as much chance of complying with treble A as Donald Trump has of winning a spelling bee. So we're not going to worry about that for today, but you are going to need to concern yourself with the first two. And then our last piece of jargon, I promise, is a success criterion, which is a three digit number a little bit like this, uh, 1.4.3. There are 78 of these, and chances are you've actually come across them before, but you didn't realize. The wonderful thing about these, I'm gonna quote a few at you throughout the talk, is if you're ever wondering about something and you're like, oh, I need to learn more about that, is you can Google for WCAG and then the number, and you will be able to easily access a wealth of free information on that topic. But to give you an example you probably already know, I'm gonna talk very briefly about alternative text. So my expectation would be um, most people usually, uh, especially in the public sector, would have some idea of what this is already, and you're probably already doing a reasonable job of it. Um, so it's a good place to start. Also, it has the convenient number 1.1.1, so it's super easy to remember. So the idea here, this, this is a WCAG requirement that if you have images and other non-text, you must include a text equivalent. So for example, consider this hypothetical web page at the top. Uh, please select from the following options and then I have a selection of uh, fruit to choose from. Now, with my eyes, I can easily see these specific items of food and I can choose which one I would want. But 
assuming that I was, for example, using a screen reader or other assistive technology, and I was having this read out to me, I wouldn't be able to see the images. So this would be presumably something like this, which works just fine. This would be a good experience. Um, unfortunately, not everyone does this. Um, now, again, my experience in the public sector has been that most organizations are aware of this and they are taking steps to, uh, to fill alt text. Um, however, in reality, 76% of public sector websites are falling short in some way. Um, one of the most common ways is either they don't specify alt text, in which case the poor user gets this, or more commonly, they specify really bad alternative text, something like this. So um, there's three different examples here, but imagine these. Uh, so imagine you're choosing from these options. The first would be some technical name that someone's clearly copied. Maybe it's the name of the file or something on their desktop, and they've not really thought about it. So pair IMG72 might mean something to you, but it's not very accessible. Um, the second, well, it's not the end of the world, but it's somewhat overly descriptive and inappropriate in this context. And the third one, even though it's technically correct, labeling that third item a Macintosh probably has a different meaning for most of your users and it could be considered ambiguous or confusing. So really just getting in the head of someone using these kind of technologies, I'm going to show you some specific ways to do that, um, can help you not just comply with the letter of the law, but also really, you know, appreciate how to make a great accessible experience. Anyway, so that was standards, levels and success criterion. We're going to move on to the meat of it, today's talk, and that is going to be on how you understand the law and actually comply with it. So what we're going to do is we're gonna look at a list of abilities and barriers. This is a convenient uh, way of breaking up accessibility into sections that you can kind of get your head around. Um, and we're gonna look at each of these four in turn, starting with the easiest, see if you can guess what that is, and working our way down to the hardest. Now, I should clarify that's actually the easiest for you because we looked at your site specifically. So for you, this will be auditory. This is where to begin. And uh, auditory um, barriers, well, 19% of the UK suffers from hearing loss. That's the kind of the headline. Um, but the truth is, chances are you've already used accessible technology here every day. That 85% of Facebook video is watched without sound, for example. That is accessible technology because you may well have hearing, but you may well choose not to use it. And this is the pattern you'll see with a lot of accessible technology. It's not just for people with a quote unquote disability. It actually improves the overall use of your site. So the requirement, as you can guess, is for captions, because that's what you probably see when you're using a Facebook video, right? If you're watching a movie trailer now on Facebook, it's pretty much 95% certain to have captions, and for good reason. Um, now, under WCAG, this is a requirement. So you need to take all of your video and your audio, well, there'll be some caveats in a moment, but your video and audio, and you need to either add captions, or you need to add a text alternative. We tested the first 100 pages of all of the um, NHS trusts, universities, and UK councils. And in that sample, we found that 21% of those websites were failing to include captions or a text alternative where they were necessary. Now, we know the actual number will be higher because we only tested the first 100 pages, and chances are there's videos tucked away in the recesses of your website you don't know about. Anyway, so captions are fine. Another alternative would be a text alternative. And this is actually my personal preferred solution for a lot of things. So say here you've got a podcast, right? Or this happens to be a podcast and a video. So a text alternative in this case is a transcript that's been included below. Now, again, like with Facebook video, this is great for accessibility. This is actually great for your users. This is just a really good user experience. Personally, I like to be able to, for example, um, watch a webinar and then have a transcript of it later. And of course, in case you're wondering, yes, there will be a, uh, a version of this webinar which will be accessible in that way provided for you later. But um, it's useful not just for accessibility, but also because you might want to look up something in that text and maybe chase down a reference. A brief note on the subtlety of subtitles and captions because the two are often confused. Um, 
under the law, you need to provide captions. Now, subtitles are where you describe, or sorry, you narrate the text of people speaking. So for example, here, Anna is saying, what a beautiful day. Captions, well, there's kind of important information omitted here. The captions is where you're narrating the sounds that would add contextual information to that scene. So in this case, um, a train approaching probably makes a bit of a difference. Um, you need to include captions where they are relevant. Now, what video and audio is covered? Well, all pre-recorded video and audio that is posted after September 2020. So you do have a little bit of time to work on this. Um, this doesn't affect video and audio posted before then. Live video and audio, you'll be pleased to hear, has been excluded on purpose. That is not part of WCAG, that is a specific EU exception, and it will definitely make your life a lot easier. So that was auditory, moving on. Um, like I said, that's the easy one. Uh, it's all about to get a little bit more challenging. We're going to take a look at cognitive. So as a headline, cognitive covers, well, a whole wealth of conditions, but here are three. 10% um, of the UK are dyslexic, 3.6% of UK boys have ADHD, 7.7% of the UK speaks English as a second language, and there are many, many more. Um, simulating these is difficult, but it turns out there are useful tools, and I'm going to show you one called Funkify, which can help you understand, appreciate, and empathize with your users. Um, now, this is a, a tool, nothing to do with us. Um, so uh, uh, forgive the plug, but it's, it's not for ourselves. Um, this costs about three and a half euros a month, or I think, I haven't checked the exchange rate, I think that's about 27,000 um, pounds. We're just gonna take a look at using Funkify to browse an example website. So I'm gonna open my browser here. So if you've installed Funkify, this is a little uh, icon in the top right corner, I don't know if you can see that. If I click on this, and it gives me a whole range of experiences for accessibility that I can simulate. So I can, for example, look at the screen with blurred vision or uh, with color blindness, which is quite cool. But what we're gonna look at right now is we're gonna look at dyslexia. Now this is one of the most popular conditions, or sorry, popular, most common conditions. Um, so it's definitely worth having a proper appreciation of it. Um, if you've never seen it before, dyslexia causes essentially the order of the letters or the, the, the structure of the words that you're looking at to become jumbled up and to continuously change. So this has the effect of making text very hard to read. I recommend you try and read what's on my screen right now. It is possible, um, but you kind of have to think about it. Um, it's just much more demanding on you. Um, and so you can imagine if you have this condition that working for a website um, you really start to appreciate certain design considerations and things that make your life easier or sometimes harder. So for example, in this case, the fact that this text here is larger makes it so much easier for me to understand what I should be sk skimming first, right? I can see this heading and I can go, oh right, I obviously need to look at this. It's, it's clear to me this is related to the image. I'm gonna try and make sense of that. On the other hand, the images which don't suffer from this scrambling would be really useful as a way of guiding me through the site. But in this case, the images aren't entirely obvious. So I'm looking at uh, individuals and there's a picture of a passport. And it's not immediately apparent to me, if I just looked at the picture, that that would have anything to do with individuals. So I have to kind of, you know, focus a bit here and, and really pay attention to understand this page. Now, another condition that I uh, should draw attention to and is particularly of interest, would be looking at distractibility. So this would cover things like ADHD. Now, what we have here is a little web game developed by uh, WebAIM, and it's made in Flash, but it's still worth checking out. Um, what they do is they give you the opportunity to play a game where bombs are falling from the top of the screen and you have to catch them, but at the same time, you have to perform various tasks on a fictional website. Um, this, it turns out, is very difficult because it is extremely hard to divide your attention between this interactive experience on the right and the um, tasks you're trying to complete on the left. So I'm just gonna show you me playing uh, a brief uh, section of that. So you can see the character catching the bombs on the right-hand side. I'm using the keyboard to try and catch those. Then looking in the top 
right corner and I see these simulation tasks. So I need to click on the center director's email address. Now I'm looking on the left and I'm, I'm trying to browse this page and oh dear, I've messed it up. Because as soon as I'm reading the page, of course I can't pay attention. So right, let's look at the contact us page. I've got a director. Yeah, I think I need to click the director's email address. I've done that, great. Now I need to complete the site survey. I found a survey and I'm trying to click on these options, but they're not working. I don't understand why. I'm clicking, I'm clicking, nothing's working. Oh, and it turns out I had to click on the radio button to the side of one of those options and that actually worked. But if I clicked on the text of the radio button, it didn't. Now that might seem like a casual annoyance and usually it is, it's definitely bad design practice, but in this case, it was so much harder for me to manage that because of the level of distraction I was um, undertaking. Now, in WCAG, there are an absolute ton of checks. We couldn't possibly go through all of them today, um, covering uh, this and, and many other areas. But just to give you some kind of headline areas to, to consider, um, readability, well, re I should say readable is a guideline which covers a whole ton of things, but um, in specifically, you're looking at things like avoiding the use of unusual words or explaining them when you do, using generally simple language so that people can kind of understand your pages, for example, if they have dyslexia or any other cognitive impairment, um, and simple things like just actually saying what languages are used so a computer or assistive technology can help them if needed. Um, we looked at these and we found at least 54% of public sector websites are failing to do any of them. And the same for the second check, which is looking at predictable aspects of your interface. This is things like using a consistent navigation structure. Um, now, this is kind of good practice. You should be doing it anyway. But we found at least 49% of public sector websites were failing to do so. And bear in mind, in this case, we can only check for some portion of both your web pages and the criteria because some of it, to be honest, is just subjective. It's, it's human judgment. But we're, oh yeah, and the, the best solution to this generally though, if you want a short version, is just keep everything simple. Um, Gov.uk, who do a fantastic job here um, in pretty much everything, um, they make their website incredibly straightforward and that is a fantastic solution to all these problems. Um, I will say we'll be coming back to Gov.uk, but you should familiarize yourself with them because GDS, who are responsible for that website, are also responsible for policing this law. So let's move on, that's cognitive. Motor. So 12% of people have tremors or some other impairment. Generally, this would cover things like, um, well, the easiest way to think of it is to assume that any input device you use can't be used by everyone. So for example, not everyone can use a keyboard, not everyone can use a mouse, not everyone can use a touchscreen. Um, and the most extreme example I'm gonna take is Stephen Hawking, who had an incredible career and was able to create many defining works of literature and science. And he was able to do so with the most limited of modes of control. And this is actually a fantastic testament to what accessible technology can achieve and one of the reasons why it's so important. But it's worth considering how on earth did he do that? So the massively simplified version is that if you want, you can reduce using of technology to pretty much to three buttons. And this is what we're gonna do now. We're gonna take a look at some sites using this. This is often known as tabs navigation. So you can use the tab key to go to the next item. You can use shift and tab to go to previous and you can press enter to select. So I am going to take my favorite website, um, again, gov.uk, and we're gonna use tabs here. So I'm just gonna press the tab key. And I don't know if you can see that, but there's a highlight in the top left corner, skip to main content, and if I press tab, I, oops, hello, for some reason that didn't work. Let me try that again. Uh, there we go, yeah, if I press tab, we get the logo highlighted and I get the search box highlighted and so on. So I can press tab and step through all the interactive parts of this page. I can press shift and tab to go back and then I can press enter to select something and it's that simple. Now, that seems easy. That was actually about the best possible experience you'll see in the history of tab browsing. Um, in fact, I don't think I've ever come across one anywhere near that good. Um, I highly recommend you try this on your own sites. You will probably want to be sitting down when you do. Um, nearly everyone will discover massive, massive flaws. I'm gonna give you one example. So this website um, is available in both English and Welsh. And when you load it, it starts with a pop-up window that asks you which of those two languages you would like to use the site in. 
So assuming that I'm using an accessible technology like you just saw, and I want to select the English button to access his site, how many times do I need to press tab to reach that button? Well, I press it once, and I don't actually see anything highlighted on the page. So I'm gonna press it again, and I don't see anything. I'm gonna press it again, and we we'll skip ahead because you have to press it 58 times before eventually that English button in the modal is selected and then I can finally enter the site. So this is a terrible experience, but it's quite surprisingly common. There are two WCAG requirements here you need to meet. The first is that your focus, which is the selected area, is visible. And this should happen by default. This is actually built into your web browser. It's built into your websites. The only reason it doesn't happen is because you've chosen to turn it off. And unfortunately, 86% of public websites, uh, public sector websites actually do disable it. So that's not good. The second thing is the focus order should make sense, right? So now this, a computer can't analyze this, but at the same time, it was very obvious to us. We entered that site and I don't think it's acceptable that I should have to press the tab key 50 plus times to access what is clearly the most likely first intent of a user on the page. So, um, both very important, relatively easy to fix. A new requirement of WCAG 2.1, um, which did not exist before, um, covers the orientation of your device. So you cannot force or require a user to have a specific orientation, so say portrait or landscape for your web pages. Um, this works all the way down to mobile phones uh, with a size of an iPhone 5 which um, is essentially 320 CSS pixels wide. That is the WCAG standard for the smallest device you practically need to care about. Um, and 62% of public sector websites fail to do this in one way or another, usually because their responsive designs are broken. Another new requirement, and if you're considering this in the, the frame of, of motor impairments, this is a really big deal, um, is automatically populating fields wherever possible. So this is something that, again, is, is great UX best practice anyway. You should be doing this. But I'm sure you've come to a web form where something like this happens, where it says, can you um, automatically fill in my contact information? And there's something on my, my phone here where I can press a button and it just types in my name and my email and whatever else for me. Well, this has always been best practice. But what you may not know is it's actually an international standard and it's really easy to do. And now you have to do it under WCAG. So um, to give you an example for the more technically minded, it's really simple. You're just going to add a little bit of code like I've shown here in yellow. Autocomplete equals email would fill in the user's email if it's known. Uh, postal code would, see if you can guess, fill in a postal code. And Tell National is just an example of a more tricky one. That would actually take their phone number and make it international for you and fill it in a field. So that's actually really easy to do and um, really powerful. Imagine how much laborious work you are saving your users, especially those with motor conditions, by doing this. And again, 87% of public sector websites are not. So that concludes three of the four areas. And you might well think, well, let's see, we're, we're about half an hour in, so this should be easy. What's left in the final point? But before we get started with that, I want to take a brief tangent into everyone's favorite topic, PDFs. Now, I have to do a section on PDFs. It doesn't really fit anywhere else, but um, they're simply unavoidable because firstly, the public sector has so many of them. I think even GDS said they produce 10,000 uh, a month themselves on their own site, and they're trying to avoid PDFs. But they're so common, but also because they're awful. Um, we found 98% of the PDFs we tested for the public sector failed the most basic checks. We didn't even bother running the more advanced checks. It wasn't really worth it. Um, so I have to talk about this briefly. PDFs are, I would say, basically flash for print, which is to say that they're useless on mobile. They're inherently inaccessible unless you work really hard. And unfortunately, they are made for the creators, not for the consumers. Um, the primary benefit of a PDF is you can take something you've already done for print and you can share it. And there is some value to that. But from a consumer's perspective, they don't work as well. Um, I want to show you a few quick examples. This is from a PDF uh, my company actually made or was in the process of making when we saw this. Um, so we had in the corner of a, a page, we had our logo, as you see at the top, right? But 
the way that um, our art software had kind of exported that was as these three separate regions. Um, so there was the kind of the glyph, if you will, the symbol, and the letter S was in part of it. Then the I and the L was in another section. And then last of all, the K, T, I, D, E was in a, a box of its own. Now, you couldn't see this because this is just the nuance of how the, you know, the artwork was created, but um, it would cause a real problem when you're trying to actually make that accessible. For one, you'd be trying to provide alternative text here and you're kind of stuck with, what more do you do? Do you put alternative text of the letter S in this one box, IL in this box and tied in this one? I mean, that results in a terrible and fundamentally inaccessible experience. The correct solution is to combine them, but that either requires modifying the original art asset or modifying the tag structure of the PDF, which is something I will recommend you read up on. It's not fun and it's not quick. So that's one example. Another would be this PDF here. This PDF, just a, a classic PDF um, from a university, I think. Um, and it looks fine, it looks, it looks good. If this was printed, this is a, you know, a good piece of design for someone to consume. But as a PDF, there's, the structure is fundamentally pretty much everything you shouldn't be doing. Um, for one, there's no clear order here. Um, it turns out by default, this PDF will select the text you're seeing here. I don't know if you can see this number one where my mouse is, but um, this is uh, the first thing that will get read out. The second thing that will get read out is this image, which doesn't have any text in it. And then the third thing will be this bit under here. And then part of this map containing London and then wherever it is now, this part of the map, and then up to six, which is where you see the title for the page, which is probably what you thought would come first. So this would be a jumble. If you were having this read out to you, this would be all over the place. Um, if you're trying to make it accessible, you have to provide an alternative text. And in many cases, the PDF hasn't even figured out where the text actually is. This sort of, this is very, very common. It's, it's extremely difficult to get around these problems. It can be done, but honestly, my advice is don't bother if you can at all avoid it. As far as mobile experience goes, well, <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's basically awful. I mean, if you've ever tried to view a PDF like that yourself on an iPhone, you know how bad that is. You basically can't make a good mobile experience. And my understanding of WCAG 2.1, that's a requirement. So I'm not really sure how PDFs are ever really meant to be accessible to anyone. Um, if you absolutely have to use them though, and I know of course they can't be avoided in some cases, a few things to know, firstly, before September 2018, um, PDFs considered essentially archival PDFs, you could pretty much ignore those. Um, you don't need to make those accessible. You probably should in an ideal world, but you don't have to. Uh, there's an exemption. Also, uh, you might be asked to provide them in an accessible format on a case-by-case -case basis, but you can handle that. Um, if you have the choice, if you're creating a PDF through something like Word, um, you want to export it and understand the export technology natively where possible. So for example, a lot of people don't know this, but Word actually contains an accessibility checker inside Word, which is actually surprisingly good. You can actually make accessible Word documents. And as long as you do that, then exporting them to PDFs, they'll be okay. But most people didn't even know that's an option. So look up on that. And then lastly, I'm afraid you're gonna to have to get Acrobat DC and a whole lot of time because it's just, yeah, there's no way around it really, it's a pain. Um, don't take my word for it though, GDS who are policing the law themselves have posted repeatedly about why you shouldn't be using PDFs and you should just put everything in HTML. Um, and I would say more succinctly, I would just say PDFs kill them before they lay eggs. But, you know, um, the consensus pretty much on this one is PDFs bad, try and avoid wherever you can. Right, so back to our four abilities and barriers. We only have one left to cover. How hard can it be? Well, visual uh, impairments affect about, well, 3% of the UK with significant sight loss and about half a percent are legally blind. But of course, somewhere around 50% of all people have some visual impairment, uh, such as uh, short sightedness. Um, you're also considering people, for example, on maybe a mobile phone who are reading it in the sun. So there's a whole ton of environmental considerations here. But visual um, creates its own special set of challenges because it affects pretty much everything. So we're gonna break it down into these three key areas. I'm gonna start off with magnification. So um, it is a requirement of WCAG that people can zoom in to uh, read things at 200% uh, of their regular size, right? So they need to be able to essentially double the, the text size one way or another. Now, 
you may recognize something like this, where um, a website has a series of letter A's, uh, often written in larger sizes. And the idea is you can click on one of these and you can enlarge the font size of that page. Um, well, I have news for you. If you do recognize this, you are not a young person. But the good news is we don't need these anymore. Um, they've been made redundant because we have responsive design, which is wonderful. So responsive design allows us to build a page like this example from the CNN, CNN, and I can zoom into it and it still works. And I can zoom into it again and it still works. And I can do this as much as I like. Uh, this results in a great experience for mobile, tablet, desktop, different screen sizes, etc. And therefore, all of the requirements for that part of WCAG is completely taken care of. I'm kidding, obviously it's not. Um, the, the problem with this is that surprisingly, a large number of public sector websites are still not designed for mobile. Uh, they're not using responsive design. Um, so to give one example, the, Uni the University of Bath, who has an excellent website that is generally very accessible and well designed and looks great on mobile and other devices that you see on the left, for some reason, their homepage for whatever has not been uh, updated yet. And so as a result, um, they're actually failing in this requirement. Now we found 67% of public sector websites were in a similar position. So um, you need to support all the way down to an iPhone 5 without scrolling in both directions. And you need to support portrait and landscape. And it's not just that it's a good thing for you to do for your user experience, it's now a legal requirement under WCAG as well. But even then, when you do all of that, you still have a problem because it turns out 36% of public sector websites then add a piece of code that turns off pinch to zoom, which you probably don't want to do. So you, um, you've already done all the work, you've got this uh, ability for people to zoom into your text and everything's great, but then a little bit of code like what you're seeing here in this uh, highlighted in yellow will undo nearly all of this great work because you've just turned off the ability for someone to take advantage of it. Um, there's literally no reason to do this. You should just remove this code. There are a few variations of this code, but it's really, really easy to fix. And like I said, over a third of websites are doing it, so please don't. Right, so on to our penultimate point, which is blindness. Now, you would think blindness would be the hardest issue to deal with. It's actually the second hardest, but we're, uh, we're gonna take a little bit of time here because a lot of people don't really know how this works. So you've heard the terms, say a screen reader, um, but maybe you've never used one or you you wouldn't even know where to start. Um, I highly recommend that you do actually take the time to use a screen reader, which is a technology that basically allows you to use websites or your computer without having sight. But it can be quite intimidating. So we built a free toolbar, uh, which I'm gonna show you now, which allows you to experience a web page and it's, a, it's a very much a simplified screen reader, but it will give you the idea of how a page works when you don't have the advantage of sight. So what I'm gonna do, as an example, is I'm gonna open this page. And again, I'm gonna click on an icon in the top right corner here. Um, so this is the, the Silk Tide Screen Reader Simulator, if I click on that. And I'm just gonna turn on audio. I don't know if you can hear that, to be fair. Um, due to the way the webinar software works, there is a small chance you wouldn't be able to hear what my computer just said. But if, it, if you can't, you can always read the text that appears here in this white panel. Essentially, what a screen reader does is it reads out the individual parts of a page and it lets you walk through them and select them. So it's similar in principle to what you had earlier with tabbed browsing, but there are differences. Um, it won't select the same things because tabbed browsing was only designed to let you select what you want to click on. But with a screen reader, you need to read everything because you, you, know, you may not want to click on some text, but you definitely want to read it. So uh, to give an example, I'm just gonna step through a few of these, uh, a few of these buttons. So. so here, there's actually a link that you can't see uh, on the screen, it's invisible. It's designed for people using a screen reader. So we've only clicked through a few links so far, and you can already see this is kind of exhausting. And um, no person using a screen reader would normally go through what I'm doing. Um, would normally go through what I'm doing um, at length, 
because um, it would just it would be incredibly tedious. So what you do do is you use a range of shortcuts. Now there's a few of them here, and again, all screen readers have these. They're designed to help you navigate um, through the page more quickly. So for example, a common one is a heading. So I've just been I've just been informed you can't hear the voice on that. So I'm just gonna I'm just turn that off. I'm gonna explain what I'm saying myself. Um, so this is literally just reading the heading that is currently selected. So BBC News navigation heading, divers humbled by Cornwall jellyfish encounter heading, and so on. Um, and so pressing H steps through these. And if I press Shift and H, I can go back up. So this is a very common action for someone using a screen reader. It means they can skip through a page much more quickly. Think about how you do it when you have your site. You look at a page, you see headings, you go next, 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 you know, skimming through them. This is the non-visual equivalent. The other shortcut that people definitely rely on is using, um, that is navigating to the next link. So if I press, I believe it's K, I can skip through to the share link, I can skip through to this link in the middle of the content, and then I can skip through these additional links um, to other related articles. Now, this is just a very quick superficial um, overview of how Screen Reader works, but if I come out of here and go back, I wanna show you how that affects you and WCAG. So let's take a fictional page here. Um, this is from some fictional university. See if you can guess the problem with this page. Um, so I'm being asked to choose one of these three options, but um, what we have here is three links with the same text. So if I was using a screen reader and I was stepping through the links, which is very common because I want to hear the things I can choose between, what I'm gonna hear is read more, read more, and read more. And this isn't particularly helpful. In fact, it's pretty fundamentally inaccessible. It's very hard to understand what's going on because those links may make sense to you visually when you can see them in context, but when they're deprived of that context, when you can't see this link is below that piece of text, all you have is the link by itself. The correct solution to this usually is to provide useful um, link text that makes sense in isolation. And to give a really simple example of that, what you could do is you could just make the titles of those options the link. That actually makes perfect sense. It's actually simpler. And to be honest, it probably represents what a lot of your users are gonna do anyway, which is click on that title. So. An additional requirement is to make sure that a screen reader can actually understand your forms. Now, 90% of public sector websites have forms that fail to do this. Um, the most common of the many flaws here would be to use what we call placeholders. So the form that you're seeing at the moment um, is using a placeholder and the placeholder is text inside the field. So you can see it's saying email and password, but that text is written inside the box you type in. Now, if I compare this with using a label, a label would appear outside of the field. I am simplifying a little bit for the purposes of expediency, but the, the important thing here is you need to define a specific text label for your fields and you need to link them to your fields. This allows accessible technology like screen readers to not just say, I am inside a field, but to say, I am inside an email field or a password field. And that way the form can be used. If you fail to do this, all of your forms essentially become input text field, input text field, input text field, button. And that's completely inaccessible. So you really need to, you know, to make sure you're using labels correctly. The other reason you should avoid placeholders is because they're just terrible. Um, if you take this example here, just forget blind users for a moment. Um, if I fill in this form on the left-hand side, um, what you see here, I can no longer see what my fields are. Uh, this isn't good. Um, a lot of the time these fields are automatically filled in and I don't even know what's been automatically filled in on my behalf. So again, using a proper label above or to the side of your field is vastly preferred and pretty much a requirement now under WK. Let's look at contrast. So contrast, I believe, is our last point and I've saved it for last for a reason because um, it is definitely one of the trickiest. Um, we'll start off with a quick comparison of old and new design styles. What you're seeing on the left here is a Google um, web app from some years ago. And you can see it's got a kind of retro design style. It's quite old fashioned, you know, blue links and ugly text and so on. And on the right hand side is a much more contemporary um, equivalent where it's all been redesigned to be soft, subtle grays and 
beautiful backgrounds and so on. And as you can probably guess, this is fundamentally and totally inaccessible. And I can show you exactly why. This is what a lot of people with a visual impairment would have seen from that screen, which is to say not a lot. Um, although it is still a little harder to read what's on the left, it is clearly legible. The right hand side has pretty much evaporated. Now under WCAG, there is a requirement that the contrast between your text color and your background color um, ranges between three to one and five to one, depending on the size and the boldness of the text. Um, we found 87% of public sector websites were failing to do this. Um, there are a number of ways of ensuring that you do. There are tools like this. If you Google for WCAG contrast, you can simply provide the colors that you're considering using or that you already use, and they will tell you if you are complying. And I would recommend that you don't try and just judge this by eye. A lot of people think that they can, but to give you one example, which of these two um, pieces of text here, the white or the black on that magenta, which is easier to read? Because as you probably guess, it's a leading question. Um, it's actually the second, but most people would normally choose the first. Um, instinctively, the white on the magenta seems easier to read, but actually under WCAG and a specific mathematical formula that they've calibrated for this, the second example is actually more legible for people with visual impairments. So this is really hard for you to intuit and you really shouldn't be bothering. You should be using tools to help you. Okay, next point, using color generally uh, as a means of distinguishing anything is pretty bad. And to give you one very focused example that 85% of public sector websites fail to do, when you have a link, you wanna make sure that the link is not just distinguished by color. So you can probably see here that the text, the link, is in blue and is a link. But if I had a common form of color blindness, this distinction would be very much reduced. And whilst you still might be able to just about make that out, imagine how hard that is to read in the midst of a large, substantial block of body text. So what you wanna be doing, and the easiest solution, is you want a non-color distinction. You want something like an underline. It's that cliche is there for a reason, and I know a lot of people don't like it aesthetically, but the advantage it brings is it makes it incredibly clear where text is a link and the surrounding text is not. Now to clarify that slightly, here's an example from our own website. And what we have here are some links at the top of the page and you'll notice these are not underlined. I do not need to underline all of my links under this law. What I need to do is I need to underline my links or otherwise make them distinct when it's not clear what part is a link and what part isn't. So if you look down here where my name appears, it says by Oliver Emberton and the by is just regular text, but the Oliver Emberton is a link. Now it would not necessarily be apparent if Oliver Emberton was written in a different color, it would be easy to miss that. To be honest, it would be easy to miss that even if you were fully sighted. Um, so adding the underline just makes that relationship more explicit. And again, we found 85% of the public sector websites don't do that. You can guess that if you've got forms like this, that they are fundamentally inaccessible for the same reason. Um, and it's a new part of WCAG 2.1 that you need to provide uh, strong contrast, which means none of these weak gray borders um, on your form fields. 93% of public sector websites are not doing this. Um, the same requirement extends to icons. So for example, if you had star ratings like this, these would fail, whereas these would pass simply because the contrast on the yellow and the white is insufficient. And it even extends things like infographics and charts, where for example, this chart here is actually fundamentally inaccessible because if you can't see the color or that your contrast um, on, on that color is insufficient, you basically can't interpret the chart. The easiest solution is to just add percentages or some other, you know, maybe a table beneath the chart, some other way of ex experiencing that data. Um, Alternatively, if you want to go to the hassle, you could redesign the visual to ensure that the co colors that are adjacent to each other are strongly contrasted or separated. Uh, this could be a lot of work, but it is an alternative. So yes, told you it was easy. That was uh, nice and straightforward. That's all four main sections we wanted to cover. Just wrapping up briefly with a few practical steps on what you're going to do about it. Mostly don't panic. Uh, you want to measure where you're at and you need to, and this is crucial, measure yourself against WCAG 2.1. If you've done this kind of analysis in the past, chances are you've tested against 2.0. Most tools, most 
companies, even most books don't cover this. In fact, I'm literally writing the only book on WCAG 2.1 now because no one else has bothered. So make sure you're testing that standard. Focus on your biggest issues. Start with level A first. Publish an accessibility statement. It's easy, it's a great first step, and you can improve it as you go. And monitor your site and keep improving it. You will never attain, probably, 100% compliance across the board on every page if you have 30,000 pages in your site. But you build a process, you set some systems up, and you make sure everything is being taken care of. Um, a brief word on your approaches for testing. Some people like to say, you know, you should do manual testing. Some people say you should do automated testing. Disclaimer, my company does automated testing, so I've got a bit of bias, but the truth is you need both. Um, manual testing is great. It means you get some experts to use your site with real screen readers and other accessible technology. They will fully test one part of your website incredibly well. You will get a level of insight that is profound. You should absolutely do that, especially if you're doing redesign, or you're doing new components. But it's not practical to do that for say, you know, tens of thousands of pages across your entire site. With automated testing, what you can do is you can test your entire site and you can automate that testing and you can be alerted when new issues occur. And so by combining those two approaches, it is possible to achieve pretty much perfect compliance around the clock. But honestly, any one of those by themselves, uh, you'll find yourself falling short. Um, I would also recommend you tell your organization, use tab browsing, seriously, load your website, use tab, use shift tab, enter, that will tell you a lot. You will probably want to sit down when you do it. And you should use a mobile screen reader. They're free, you already have one, assuming you have a phone. Uh, just Google for iPhone voiceover or Android talkback, it's worth it. Use your site, you'll probably, again, be horrified, but it's great. Um, if you can't be bothered with those, Google for silk tie toolbar, we've got our own free one. Like I said, it's simplified from a screen reader, but it'll give you an idea of your experience. Teach your team, get your designers to use contrast and fields, get your editors to use alt text links and captions, and get your developers to buy my book because it's very, very long. Um, there's a lot of stuff to cover. And yes, that's basically what I wanted to cover today. That was the five stages of becoming accessible. Hopefully I've helped take you from denial and maybe somewhere around anger, bargaining, depression, but one day, hopefully we can all collectively achieve acceptance. Let's move on to some questions. So I am going to just bring up Q&A. So, okay, I have eight questions. Right, okay, so I'm going to start with uh, Jeff, who's asked a question, is your understanding that it's new websites that are applicable for the particular compliance states or new web content? That is a good question. And unfortunately, the powers that be have not given an unambiguous answer. Um, I think the truth is there's, the letter of the law is a little bit um, muddled and it's because it's incredibly hard. It's like measuring the shape of a cloud to know where it starts and ends. Imagine you had a website and you decided to change the CSS so that the design looked different but the rest of the site didn't change. Did you have a new website? Like that's kind of a technical nuanced question but no one can really answer that question. So um, in practical terms, I think you'll find that as it'll be relatively soft touch until such a time as the new deadline passes around next year, September. Um, I think um, really what they've tried to accomplish with that division of time is not so much to police you rigorously on it, but to say you should be starting all of your new stuff to be compliant now so that you're more prepared to have everything compliant later. So they're basically just trying to phase in the implementation but I don't think it's gonna be harshly policed across either one of those lines. Okay, so that's that question. Uh, moving on, we have, um, Mitch has asked, would just having non-accessible PDFs constitute non-compliance? How would that be policed? Okay, so, whew, um, well, I can tell you a little bit about how it is gonna be policed. GDS are using uh, automated tools and manual checks in order to police websites. So um, they're also going to rely presumably on people contacting them and reporting non-compliance. Um, I would imagine the problem you have with a PDF is in some cases, as you can imagine, you fundamentally cannot make it accessible or it would be a terrible idea to try. You might have say a map, right? And like a visual of a map, you just, that needs to be a completely separate document that explains the pertinent information but does not look like it. So what you would do instead is you would uh, provide a separate web page 
And as long as that content, the, the material you're trying to convey is available and is practically available, so it's not like just hidden, you would never find it, then I still believe you are complying with the law. I hope that answers your question. Right. Um, see, Gregory has asked, do you have any specific advice regarding accordion modules and the principle of hiding content? Right. Oh, uh, that's complicated. Um, so there's actually a really good site. I don't know if I can, can I come out of this and see if I'm going to. Uh, I'm trying to think of what you know what I've actually forgotten the link I apologize um, what I'll do uh, we'll throw up some stuff after this um, so you can actually see uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a, a link basically but yeah there, there's actually a website on design patterns that's specifically designed to make them accessible and it's a really complicated question I think there's something like a 5,000 word answer to that question um, but I'll I'll throw that up on the notes and we'll uh, we'll we'll email you all of that later so you'll you'll have access to that. Okay. Um, are we responsible for the accessibility of PDFs uploaded to our website by third parties? Okay, so there is actually a specific exemption for content that is created by third parties, or I should say, uh, areas that are the responsibility of third parties that you didn't do that said it is a bit again annoyingly confusing um i think the, the the principle is to basically give you some um get out in the event that say you're using i don't know let's say a google plugin that you have to use but google are refusing to make it compliant um i would have imagined though that pdfs would be tricky um i am not i have to be honest i i don't have a, a clear cut yes no on that one um but yes I, I to be honest if at all possible i just err on the side of extract the relevant information put it on the web page avoid the pdf if you can um, and again if it's before september last year then you can probably avoid it entirely okay um let's have a look so we've got a lot of questions that are on consistent level of upvotes so i'm just going to pick these at random um are online platforms such as isu a good alternative to hosting pdfs on the website i'm afraid i'm not familiar with that platform so i can't really say um is there an eta for my new book <laughs> oh is this my publisher uh yes is the answer um <laughs> can we use aria labeling to make repeated text like read more distinguishable yes you absolutely can do that that is a good solution so um if you write a link and you um and the, the text for the link is let's say read more, which isn't ideal, but let's say it is, you can still do aria label equals and provide an accessible alternative, that is just fine. Uh, screen readers handle that pretty well now. Um, Angela asks, are sans serif typefaces a requirement for on-screen text under regulations? Not that I've heard of, um, no. Um, well, it's, it's, I mean, I've, I've read the WCAG standard multiple times from start to finish, I've never heard of that one, so. Um, Yes, unless unless I'm mistaken something. By all means, send me a link, but otherwise, uh, no, I've never heard of that. Um, okay, uh, Martha asks, does the orientation rule also include interactive experiences such as games? Right, so there are specific exemptions for where your, ex, uh, your interaction, your experience, whatever, absolutely would require the... Um, a specific orientation. So the, the, the example I tend to give is imagine you made an app that scanned checks, right? So such an app would, because you're literally scanning something you cannot control, you couldn't really read it sideways, you can't control that. Um, the argument had been made that that would be something you could exclude and you would be allowed to only use landscape, say. Um, but um, it would probably be harder to argue that for a game, I would say um you could probably also claim that it's an unreasonable burden it's a disproportionate burden exclusion in the event that something is considered so difficult that to comply with it would be completely and utterly impractical for your organization so let's pretend that there was some some minor accessibility issue and the only way to fix it would be to ditch your cms commission a new one build a new website and spend a ton of money on, on doing that to fix a minor issue, that would be considered disproportionate as you can make that exclusion. It's harder to justify that for a game, but maybe. Um, 
What are the disadvantages of over-describing and giving more detailed alt tags for images? Uh, yeah, you know what? You should just use a screen reader. Seriously, this will give you an idea because there's actually a really good article. I need to make a note of this as well. Uh, WebAIM has written the article on alt text. Um, and I'll, I'll share that in the notes. But basically, um, there isn't a one size fits all for alt text, right? So it depends on the context. In some cases, you want nothing. You literally want to make it blank on purpose. Some cases, you just want a word. Uh, but in other cases, the same image in a different context may warrant a far more elaborate description. Um, again, there's a great article on that. I'll send you the link. Um, right. Uh, so how we have time, we've got to be getting pretty close to the end now. I think I'll just get a couple more questions and we'll, we'll wrap up. So are we responsible for making a third party service that's used on our site accessible? Uh, again, there is an exemption for third party services. It would probably depend, however, on the specifics of what it's Handling, is YouTube captioning good to go? Yes, YouTube captioning is fine as long as you use it correctly. Um, when do PDFs need to be compliant? Um, you have, I believe, you know what? I don't, wanna, I don't wanna misquote myself. I'm pretty sure I said it was next September. Um, yeah, okay, and I think that's probably all we have time for today. So thank you so much for all of your questions and all of your time. Um, if you'd like help with your web accessibility, here is my email address. Feel free to uh, drop me a line. I'll check out our website. Um, we will be preparing additional webinars like this in the future. So we're going to send you some questions um, later on today. And if you'd like to take a chance to uh, give us your thoughts and uh, make any feature requests, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot, guys.